Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Nuclear Criticality Safety Lecture Series. Today we're going to discuss criticality safety postings and procedures, and we'll start by discussing the 1964 criticality accident at Wood River Junction, where inadequate procedures and postings contributed to a fatal accident. This accident took place at the United Nuclear Fuels Recovery Plant in Wood River Junction in Rhode Island, which was designed to recover highly enriched uranium from scrap. The facility received already dissolved scrap in the form of urinal nitrate, and then they purified and concentrated this uranium using tributyl phosphate mixed with kerosene. After the final acid strip, the uranium solution was purified to remove any residual organic compounds using trichloroethane, or TCE. Initially, the TCE was designed to last between six months and one year, but after operations began in March of 1964, a larger amount of residual organics and a higher retention of uranium reduced the TCE's lifetime to only one week. Therefore, a procedure was designed to remove the residual uranium, which was usually between 400 ppm and 800 ppm in concentration, from the TCE before they discarded it. This process involved washing the solution with sodium carbonate. This low concentration uranium solution was stored in geometrically favorable, long, skinny, 11 liter polyethylene bottles. These bottles were about 12 centimeters in diameter and just under one meter long, and the procedure for washing the solution with sodium carbonate involved a worker hoisting the 20 to 30 pound bottle onto their shoulder and then using their shoulder as a fulcrum while they rocked the bottle back and forth. This modified procedure was not documented anywhere, and it was rather laborious. On July 16th, an unusually large amount of contaminated TCE had accumulated, and to process it more quickly, an operator proposed mixing the solution in the sodium carbonate mix-up tank. This tank was 18 inches in diameter, 26.375 inches in depth, and it was located on the third floor of a tower housing some solvent extraction columns. The supervisor allowed this change, so long as the uranium solution involved contained less than 800 ppm of uranium. This change was not approved by the facility's regulating authority, but between July 16th and July 24th, two operators took turns washing approximately 10 to 12 bottles of solution using the sodium carbonate mix-up tank. On the day directly before the accident took place, a plant evaporator had failed to operate, and it was thus disassembled for cleaning. Upon cleaning and inspection, a plug of uranium nitrate crystals was discovered. These crystals were dissolved using steam, and the resultant 256 gram per liter of uranium solution was drained into 11 liter polyethylene bottles identical to those that normally held the low concentration TCE solution. These bottles were labeled to mark that they contained high concentrations of uranium. On Friday, July 24th, an operator asked his supervisor if it was necessary to wash a bottle containing some contaminated TCE. The supervisor said that it was not necessary because the TCE was going to be used to rinse a process column, but the worker decided to wash the bottle anyway, possibly to obtain an empty bottle. Unfortunately, the operator mistook a bottle containing the high concentration uranium solution with one containing the normally low concentration TCE, and he brought the bottle upstairs to the sodium carbonate mix-up tank. After this accident took place, the label identifying that this bottle contained high concentration solutions of uranium was discovered at the bottom of these stairs. Upon arriving on the third floor, the operator poured the contents of the bottle into the mix-up tank, which already contained 41 liters of sodium carbonate solution. The operator saw a blue flash after nearly all of the bottle's contents had been poured into the makeup tank, and the prompt supercritical transient caused about 20% of the solution to splash out of the tank and onto the ceiling, the walls, and onto the operator. The operator fell to the floor, but quickly regained his footing and ran from the area into an emergency building as the radiation alarms sounded. This operator quickly boarded an ambulance and was driven to Westerly Hospital, but this hospital actually refused to admit him because they did not have facilities to treat acute radiation syndrome. So then the ambulance had to drive the operator to the Rhode Island Hospital, which was 45 miles away in Providence, Rhode Island, where he was admitted. This detour may have been the difference between life and death 
for someone involved in a criticality accident, and it highlights the importance of effective emergency planning. But unfortunately, in this case, it made no difference for the operator. The prompt supercritical transient released 10 to the 17th fissions and gave the operator an approximately 100 gray radiation dose, a dose that would have been fatal even with optimal treatment. The operator passed away 49 hours after the accident. About 90 minutes after the supercritical excursion, the operator's supervisor and shift superintendent entered the room where the accident took place, and they turned off the sodium carbonate mix-up tank's stirring mechanism. The supervisor actually waited outside of the room while the superintendent turned off the mechanism, and this positioning may have saved his life. Turning off the stirring device caused the stirring vortex to collapse, and the solution settled into a less leaky configuration. This geometry change provided enough reactivity for the solution to once again go supercritical, and the tank likely underwent a series of small prompt supercritical transients, the first of which likely began as the superintendent left the room. After leaving the room, the supervisor and the superintendent went to drain the mix-up tank using remote valves, thus ending the supercritical excursions. The radiation alarms from the accident were still sounding when the supervisor and the superintendent turned off the stirring device, and so they did not realize that these subsequent supercritical excursions were occurring until they received their dose estimates for the month and realized that the supervisor had received about 100 rad of dose and that the superintendent had received about 60 rad of dose. Thankfully, both the supervisor and the superintendent survived this dose. Like many accidents, the procedures that led to this accident were not documented and were not approved by the facility's regulator. However, this accident also highlights the need for appropriate labeling. The label marking that the bottle held high concentration uranium fell off while it was being transported, and the worker may have noticed this label and may have prevented the accident had the label remained intact. Then again, the operator loaded and moved this bottle while the label was initially attached, so perhaps the label's design was at fault, and a more noticeable label could have prevented the accident. Likewise, storing the high concentration uranium in a bottle that was identical to the TCE low concentration uranium bottles probably also contributed to this accident. Many criticality accidents were caused by flagrant ignorance of procedures. Some of these accidents were due to larger safety culture issues, but procedures and postings must still be sufficiently clear to prevent issues. According to ANSI ANS 819, the purpose of writing operating procedures is to facilitate and document the safe and efficient conduct of the operation. Procedures shall include those administrative controls and limits significant to the nuclear criticality safety of the operation. In other words, our goal when writing and designing procedures is to present the necessary information and to describe an operation's steps sufficiently so that an operator can work safely and efficiently. ANSI ANS 819 also states that the Nuclear Criticality Safety Staff shall provide technical guidance for the design of equipment and for the development of operating procedures, so we must assist operations in developing procedures, and this process is actually fairly formal and fairly well scrutinized. Procedures must meet a high standard for quality, and will want to use trained writers to draft these procedures. Several writing guides exist to help us draft quality procedures. We'll also want to get input from operations and from their supervisors when we draft procedures. They're going to be the end customers of these procedures after all, and we'll want to know if something doesn't make sense or if something is unclear up front. Some things we'll want to consider when preparing procedures include the paper size and color, since a site might have specific color coding for different types of procedures, how to number steps so that it's clear which step comes first, how to number our pages and where to place the page numbers, the size and style of print, will key steps stick out or will they blend in with other text on the page, what content is required by the procedure, and that any abbreviations used in the procedure are universally understood by operations staff. The procedures themselves will generally include a description of their purpose and scope, any relevant definitions, the responsibilities of operations staff, requirements to comply with the procedure, procedural steps, relevant records to maintain, references, any appendices, or any attachments. The content of the procedure should be accurate and easy to use, 
and we should always remember who's going to be using the procedure. We'll want to try and get inside of operations as heads when you're writing procedures. So what steps need to be emphasized? What steps might they be tempted to skip? Is the procedure too technical for the operator to understand? Or do we use straightforward language and terminology so that there is no confusion whatsoever? We'll want to design procedures for the least qualified user, so keeping things approachable and straightforward is our goal. If you want to see examples of texts that are not approachable, straightforward, or easy to read, I've provided a link in this video's description for my ResearchGate publications. Lastly, we'll want to write procedures in a way that encourages compliance with the procedure. In other words, we want to make it easy to do things the right way and hard to do things the wrong way. Operators are inventive, and they'll find faster and easier ways to do things if our procedure recommends steps that are too slow or too inconvenient. This happened during the Tokamira accident, during the 1958 Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory accident, and during the Wood River Junction accident, where the operators decided to use the geometrically unfavorable sodium carbonate mix-up tank. A procedure that is easy to follow is a procedure that is likely to be followed. A procedure that is too long is also bad. How many of us skim through instruction manuals and try and single out the stuff that we actually need to read to do the job? With procedures, shorter is usually better, and the amount of detail that we should include in a procedure will depend on the complexity of the task, the skill, experience, and training of the operator, the frequency of the task, and the consequence of an error. A procedure for skydiving or tightrope walking should probably be pretty detailed. Our goal should be to provide enough detail for the operators to do their job and to provide no additional unnecessary detail. Unnecessary information makes it more likely that the operator will miss or skim over some necessary information. It's best to only include one action per step in the procedure. We're very likely to miss a necessary action if each step or each bullet contains multiple actions. In that case, it's likely that we'll just see that we did the one action, assume that that's it, and then move on to the next step. You've probably experienced this firsthand if you do a lot of cooking using recipes that you find over the internet. A lot of online recipes garble together multiple actions into the same step, which makes it very easy for us to forget to add an ingredient to the pot or to put something into the pan until it's much too late. Procedures should also have warnings and consequences clearly identified and separate from the other steps in the procedure. This makes sense, since we should want to highlight any text that notifies operators of a potentially dangerous action. We should also place warnings on the same page as their related action, even if it means bumping steps to the later pages. If an operator is unlikely to see a warning until after they've already completed the step, then the warning is essentially useless. We should also have nuclear criticality safety staff review our procedures, and also have operations staff and their supervisors review our procedures as well. Operations is the ultimate customer for our procedures, and if things are too confusing, or if we don't understand how the operation actually works in real life, then we need to know. We'll need to make sure that operations can easily understand every step within a procedure. Lastly, procedures need to be properly maintained to remain effective. Our job as criticality safety engineers doesn't end after we finish the criticality safety evaluation, and we'll need to edit our procedures if the process changes so that a series of steps and warnings is skipped, or if the process has changed in a way that introduces new dangers to operators. Postings also serve an important role in nuclear criticality safety. ANSI ANS 819 states that Procedures should be supplemented by posted nuclear criticality safety limits, which is a statement that is sometimes surprising to people. This statement says that we should use postings, which means that postings are not technically necessary. Nonetheless, proper postings can make operations significantly safer, and so we should always use them whenever we can. If we do use postings, then ANSI ANS 819 states that where these supplements are used, they shall be kept in good repair, legible, and consistent with current controls and limits. The posting in the Wood River Junction facility that warned of a higher concentration of uranium may have been accurate and well-intended, 
but the fact that it fell off the bottle might have directly caused the accident. When designing postings, they should be consistently formatted, user-friendly, and carefully wordsmithed so that they are likely to be helpful to operators. In general, we'll want to make sure that postings describe the type and form of material for which they are relevant, that they describe any quantity or spacing limits, and any possible moderation restrictions. Postings should only address administrative limits and controls. A posting for a passive control doesn't make any sense, since a passive control will be built into the system and will not rely on any proper operator action. Postings will generally focus on the maximum or minimum limits for some parameter, and will often have size or formatting requirements. Once prepared, postings must be verified by a nuclear criticality safety engineer, both to evaluate their style and effectiveness, and to make sure that their instructions match the process's criticality safety evaluation. Postings should also be evaluated by the process's operators, since they're going to be the ones using the posting. In summary, when preparing a posting, we should try and get into the head of our operators and design the postings so that the operators will read them. Our postings should be clear, they shouldn't be wordier than necessary, and we shouldn't have too many postings. If we have an entire wall of postings for every single process, then it's very unlikely that operators will reflect and consider every single posting before they begin an operation. Instead, short lists of bullet points are ideal, and our postings should be consistent in format. If operators know where to look for limits because every posting puts this information in the same place, then it will be very easy for operators to follow postings. This sample posting is a good example of the points I've discussed. It's short and sweet, but still informative. It clearly states that it's a criticality safety limit posting, and it says that this posting applies to the Sintering Room U308 powder rack. The limits for this operation are clearly labeled and outlined, and they don't contain any more information than they need to. This posting uses the ETE, abbreviation for Edge to Edge, presumably because this abbreviation is common throughout the facility. But everything else is very clear and very easy to understand. It even has text at the bottom to describe where and how this posting should be maintained. This concludes our lecture on designing and developing clear and effective postings and procedures. In the coming lectures, we'll begin our descent into methods for determining an operation's upper subcritical limit, and we'll start with a crash course into the wild world of nuclear data.